Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Uh, just as I was uh, coming to church this morning, I was listening to the radio, and, and uh, not really to the radio, to Spotify, but to worship songs, and there's a song, I actually had never heard it before, but it was um, just a song about uh, just being in the dwelling of the Lord, and so, or dwelling in the presence of the Lord, and I came, I came across this verse, I was reflecting on that this morning, um, and uh, just thinking about um, what it means for us to be in the presence that, you know, we talk about coming here and coming into the presence of God, but that we as God's people dwell in his presence, live in his presence. And so we come together this morning, even if it's a small group this morning, uh, but we, we celebrate the, the, the life that we have in him, the dwelling place that we have in him, the hope that we have in him, um, and that we are his people together. Um, as God's people, a couple announcements for us. Um, so first one is on September 26th at 6 p.m. Um, there's going to be a community prayer night um, where we're going to pray and walk around the campus at the Blaine Schools. Um, so I encourage you to come to that at 6 p.m. Um, uh, so, so come and be a part of that. Also, we're doing a coat drive right now to, to care for those that are, that are in need. Um, so you can bring coats in, uh, put them in the back, in the bin at the back table there uh, by the back table um, and uh, you have the month of September I believe to do that um, and then they'll distribute those out in October and 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 so I encourage you to do that um, uh, as I said before like coats are an item that's in huge demand there so um, yeah so with that rather than pray this morning I'm going to read through this this that what I started with was the beginning of Psalm 91 but as I was reading it this morning and kind of not just reflecting on the dwelling place but thinking about my message and everything like that I just felt like this is a very appropriate psalm and just that God really wants to speak to us about his his protection his his love his his fighting the battles with us and for us uh, so I just want to read this psalm and then we'll move back into our singing time so those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about Yahweh. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. 
Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, though the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make Yahweh your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You'll trample upon lions and cobras. You'll crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. Yahweh says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Amen. Thank you, Justin. We're going to invite you to stand with us once again. Count on one thing, the same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. again I count on one thing the same God who never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out oh yes I will lift you high the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify. Of all things, nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all things. Nothing can stand against. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. For joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. your prayer this morning. Give me eyes to see more of who you are. May what I behold still my anxious heart. Take what I've known and break it all apart. For you, my God, are greater still. No sky contains, no doubt restrains all you are, the greatness of our God. I spend my life to know I'm 
Won't you feel 
desire for anything that is not of you and is of me. I want more of you and less of me. just pray that you would be filling us. God, that our lives, our worship, would not be centered on ourselves, of, of seeking for ourselves, but of giving and offering to you, God. God, help me to give myself fully. Help us to give ourselves fully. Fill us, and lead us, and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can keep playing, actually, Jeff. Just uh, wondering, I know we're small, sometimes when it's small like this, this doesn't go very well, but I uh, just feeling like um, wondering what uh, prayers or requests you might have, thoughts that are on your mind, or praises as well. We often just take a request, but uh, praises as well. Yeah.
Awesome. Awesome. So, Linda just feels God answering prayer for her granddaughter who is going to be attending a, a Christian college at Grand Canyon University. So, we can praise God for that. Other prayers or praises? I know uh, it's not, they're not saying it, but I'll just say it. So many of you watched Joanna grow up uh, as, uh, from a young child. And if you're not aware that Joanna Takeda is no longer Joanna Takeda. <laughs> oh, <laughs> never mind then. <laughs> okay. She is still Joanna Takeda, but she's also Joanna Takeda plus one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, you can praise God just of uh, that Joanna uh, is married last week. Um, and I'm assuming, I haven't really talked to you guys. I'm assuming that, that well, I, that would have been really bad if, like, she got stood up at the altar and just started talking about this. <laughs> so, <laughs> assuming it all went well. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. All right, other prayers or praises? Yeah, Logan? So, so God gave Logan a song that really spoke to him. So, praise God for that. Other praise, praise, yeah, Dan. So Dan has a friend suffering from anxiety disorder. Yeah, Debbie. So Debbie said the pastor that married them is uh, in likely his last days in this life. Um, and so just prayer for, for passing, is he, uh, for his passing. His name is Jerry. Um, and for also to be with his wife as well. Right. Anybody else? I know... Uh, just uh, as a pastor, you know, he talks to lots of people going through the different things. And I think you just pray for uh, parents in our church in BCF, right? And uh, now just like parenting and just being able to wisdom and parenting and um, God's grace and, and everything. And I mean, that's obviously, I think that's something we should all be praying for all the time anyway. But I just think it could be a focus of prayer right now for us. Anything else? All right. Um, so those prayers and praises again were Linda with her granddaughter for Joanna's uh, getting married, um, for the, the song that God uh, gave to Logan, um, for uh, Dan's friend uh, suffering anxiety, for uh, Gary and Debbie's pastor who married them, and then for the parents of BCF. So let's just take a couple minutes. Um, if God leads you to go and pray with any of these people, you can go, go and pray with them. Oh, the other thing I meant to say, too, is we can also just keep remembering um, Libya and the flooding uh, there. You know, uh, and I just can't imagine, you know, like 20,000 people. I was thinking, like, all of Blaine and Birch Bay just kind of, in a matter of moments, wiped out and, and, and everything. Can you just imagine that? It's just prayer for um, God to work there as well. So, yeah, let's just take a few minutes to um, pray uh, for these things and then we'll I'll close us in a few minutes
This I declare about Yahweh. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. God, we thank you, God, that, that you are our refuge, our place of safety. God, we thank you for uh, these praises that we have, ways that we've seen prayers answered with Linda's granddaughter, with Joanna, with Logan, and just uh, putting a song in his heart, God. Um, God, we, we thank you that you are at work, that you are faithful to us, that your spirit moves amongst us and in our lives, God. And God, may that provide hope for us in the things, that, the trials that we face. God, whether it's um, friends and loved ones that are suffering or, or dying, whether it's our own families and issues we're facing, God, may we know that you alone are our place of refuge. May your faithfulness to us remind us to come to you again and again. And may we trust you to work even when we don't see or understand what you're doing, God. God, we thank you. The, the psalm we read this, day, this morning, it says, when they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. God, may we hold on to your promises. May we believe your word. And may we trust you to be at work, God. Not because of our worth, but because of yours. Thank you for your love for us, your commitment to us, God. God, I pray for, for all these those families in Libya who lost loved ones to this tragic flood. God, I pray for your church persecuted though it might be there to respond well, to love well, and just that you would do something great and accomplish something great there, God. May you turn their hearts and their hope to you, God. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you guys. If you'd like to worship by giving, you can do so online, uh, bcfgiving.churchcenter.com, or you can drop your offering in the back. Um, and just thank you for all those that, that give faithfully and just uh, thanks for helping and supporting. And we're not singing that song. I just bumped that button. But All right. Let's go and dismiss our kids for uh, Kids Church. So uh, preschool through second grade in the primary room and third through fifth grade in the youth room. All right, so for those of you that are left, we're about to get into the book of First Thessalonians, but before we do, in just a minute, we're going to have a paper airplane flying contest. So who would like to participate in this paper airplane flying contest? Come get a piece of paper. You can start folding your airplane now. Uh, yeah, come on up. You got to come, come get one. <laughs> Anybody else? You don't have to be a child. I like making paper airplanes. Logan, you want, a paper, you want to make a paper airplane? Here you go, bud. All right, anybody else? Did you get one, Dakota? Come get one then, dude. Come on up. <laughs> All right. You just want to watch them lose. All right. Um, yeah, so um, we're going to be in First Thessalonians today. We'll get to the paper airplanes in just a minute. We're going to be in First Thessalonians today. Um, so remember, um, the book of 1 Thessalonians is written to a community that the gospel is transformed, that Paul came to with the gospel, um, that turned their lives, turned their world upside down. And so uh, then Paul ended up leaving. We'll talk a little bit more about that again today. Um, leaving the, the community because they were facing persecution. 
Uh, but he wrote this letter to them to encourage them to persevere in their faith, to not give up, um, and, and to, to offer them uh, encouragement and hope. And so we've been looking at this uh, and looking at um, what it means to have your lives transformed by the gospel. Um, and so today we're going to be looking at uh, 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 the battle that they're facing um, and the upside down nature of that battle and, and how we respond to it. Um, so remember the section that we're in, Paul's been reminding the church of kind of uh, their past with him. Their experiences that we, they have together, um, and in, in the middle of this, he says this. He says, but since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. So um, Paul says uh, that he desired to see the Thessalonians. He desired to go back to the city of Thessalonica, to go back and visit those Christians that, that he, had, he had taught the faith uh, to. Um, but then he says that Satan hindered us, that Satan hindered us. And so what we're going to be talking about today is the spiritual opposition that exists and that we face as God's people. When our lives are turned upside down by the gospel, we face spiritual opposition to what God desires in our life. We face spiritual opposition to what God desires in our lives. Like Paul literally says, Satan hindered us to coming. Now, for many people, um, this kind of seems like a relic. It's like a primitive belief. Like, do you believe in the devil? you believe in demons? Do you believe in these, these dark spiritual forces? Like, are you crazy? Are you stupid or something? Why would you believe in that? Um, and a couple of different answers uh, that, that, that I have to say. So the first one is actually where our paper airplanes come in. So if you, go brought, if you have a paper airplane... Why don't you go stand at the very back there, back by that uh, farthest line. If you're in the front, you might want to watch that you're not going to get hit in the, bat, in the head. Let's see whose paper airplane can go the farthest. Who can get the closest up here? You can be on this side too. Girl, Tori and Katie, if you guys want to be, you guys be on this aisle too. Let's see whose, whose paper airplane goes the farthest. All right, so on the count of three, let's fly them and see who goes the farthest. One, two, three, go. Whoa. Oh, I think Leif is the winner right, right up there, right? Good job, Leif. Oh, oh, late entry. All right, you can go get your paper airplanes. Don't throw them again. <laughs> All right, Leif, let me see your winning paper airplane up here. It's a very nice design here. All right, so when Leif threw his airplane, why did his airplane go forward? Yeah, Dakota? Okay, so he made good aerodynamics. Okay, but why did it go forward? He threw it. So what's that called in physics? Anybody know? Thrust, right? So it had thrust, and it went forward. Why did it float in the air? Another physics word. Lift. Good job. <laughs> All right. Wait, who just studied this? Why aren't they answering that? <laughs> All right, so I had thrust, it went forward, right? Energy was transferred from Leif into the airplane, it went, and, and the energy thrust it forward. It had lift that kept it off the ground, but why didn't it just keep flying forever? Then what happened? Gravity, yeah, gravity took over. Gravity opposed the, the, the thrust and the lift, and then gravity pulled it down. Can anybody see thrust? Can you see thrust? No, can you see lift? No, can you see gravity? No, you can see the effects of all these things, but you can't see any of, all, any of these things. But just because we can't see them does not mean that they're real. Just because we can't see them does not mean they're not at work. Did you know that, um, there, uh, who here has heard of the unified theory? Of, the unified theory? Anybody know what that is? So in physics, the unified theory is uh, what's fascinating about physics right now is, you know, scientists have studied, physicists have studied, I, should, I think I'm going to throw this back, so I'm just going to hold this man. Where are you at, Leif? All right, Leif, I'm going to try to get this to you. Well, I almost killed Jeff. <laughs> You're, you had better thrust than me. All right, um, so unified theory is, is um, uh, physicists, they know, they know kind of that gravity works. They, they can predict how gravity works with large bodies, but then when you get down to like the, the atomic level and you get to like protons and neutrons and electrons and quarks and all these things, these things don't seem to operate by the system of gravity. So they have systems of how these things interact uh, together. 
but the systems that, that they find with those things don't work with the systems of gravity. And so what's fascinating is that scientists don't really know how gravity works. Like they can predict what it will do. They can predict its effects, but they don't even know how gravity works, right? They don't have to know how something works to know that it does work. And so bringing this back to the spiritual world that we face spiritual opposition, we might think that this might sound like a primitive idea, a primitive notion, a weird notion. Well, we don't see these things. You know, why, why do we actually believe they exist? Is that there are things that we see all, or that we believe all the time that we can't see we can observe their effects and we know they exist. There are things that we don't understand like gravity, but we know it's there. And so it's not that weird to me to say, well, there's a spiritual realm that we can't fully see, but we can see the effects of, right? Have you ever uh, been in a room or an event where you can just feel the spirit of that room? Maybe something happens and, and, and like, like you can just feel the spirit change in a place, right? We use those words. And I think it's something we can all ex- say we've experienced to some degree or another. Like we can observe the effects of the spiritual realm. Now, this can be hard for us, I think, in our culture. Um, another, another little interesting fact, little thing here. I read about a study this week as I was preparing for this message. Um, so in this study, this was, uh, they, they, they took a group of people and they gave them all a math problem to do and to graph out. And they said this math problem is going to show the effectiveness of a skin lotion, a skin cream. And they gave half the group um, that the problems would show that the skin cream uh, helped, and half the group the problem would show the skin cream hurt or, or had no effect. And so then they gave everybody the problem, and everybody did the problem, got a certain amount of people got it right. What do you think that the people that were more educated and better at math, how do you think they did on the problem? compared to the other group? What would you think? Do you think people are good at math or do better at a math problem? This is not rocket science here. Yeah, they did better, right? The people, so, so, they, so people, they, they kind of scored how people did with this math problem. People that were better at math did better at it. Then they took the same exact problem, but instead of making it about skin cream, they made it about gun control. And then they took half the group and they said, uh, and they pulled everybody's like political beliefs and ideas about gun control. And they took half the group and the problem would show that gun control decreased crime in an area. And half the group, they said the problem would show that gun control increased crime in an area. And what was fascinating is that as they studied this, people uh, did worse on the math problem than it, when it was just about skin care. It was the same numbers and everything, but when it was about skin care, they did better at the problem. Um, and not only that... Uh, and they did worse based on their political beliefs, right? So if it didn't fit with what they thought gun control should do in the situation, they were more likely to get the problem wrong. And then not only that, what was really fascinating about it is that the smarter, more educated, better at math you were, the more likely you were to get it wrong when it didn't fit with what you thought it should be. So, so the, impl- what are the implications of that are that when we have a preconceived notion about something, when we have a preconceived idea about the world, that we try to fit whatever we have within that framework. Now, I know we all think, I, if you're like me, you think, man, those people, those silly people, I wouldn't do that, <laughs> right? But the truth is, is there's probably that, that, that there's, a, there's a part of our brain that we're all like that. Now, when we think about this in the terms of the spiritual realm, we have been raised in a naturalistic culture. And what I mean by a naturalistic culture is that we're very influenced by science and the scientific method. I'm not against science. I think science is a wonderful way to see how God has revealed himself through creation. But science has limits. Science is limited because it's based on observation, so it's limited on things that you can observe. It's limited things that you can taste, see, touch, smell, hear, right? It's it's limited to the physical world. But because our culture is, is, is so based on that, and we've been raised a naturalistic philosophy, it impacts our mind. And so when we have that preconceived naturalistic philosophy underlying our worldview, and we encounter un- the unexplainable, the things from the spiritual realm, we're quick to put them into our little box of the natural world. Even me, like I say I believe this stuff, but my, my go-to when, I, when something is unexplained, my go-to is like, wait a minute. That could just be a coincidence. That could just fit into this. That could be because of that, right? We're quick to put those things into a box. And we have to remember that there is a spiritual realm, that there are things that are unexplainable. 
that things do occur, occur outside of what we can would see and observe. And that we all really know of these things. Like we hear stories of these things. We, a lot of us have experienced these things before. There is evidence actually of a spiritual realm that we often will try to fit because of our cultural worldview into a box. But we are actually, when you look at the majority of the world, and especially of the majority of human history, our culture is kind of in a minority there, right? Most cultures in the world actually recognize the, the, the existence of a spiritual realm. If you, I'm sure if you talk to Wendy growing up in, in Papua New Guinea, that, that there's no doubt of a spiritual realm there. Like most missionaries I talk to serving overseas, um, especially in, in, in places that are, are you know, undeveloped, unscientific, unnaturalistic is another way that might, you might say, places are fully aware of a spiritual realm. There's no doubt about it amongst people. Well, why is that? Is it because they're all stupid? Maybe, maybe, if it, maybe the deficiency there isn't that with their culture, maybe it's with ours, right? There is evidence. There are things that we see all the time that there is a spiritual realm. And so I think that we have to take this seriously as believers, that, that Scripture uh, tells us about the spiritual realm, that we see the spiritual realm, and that the spiritual realm is, exists, and that not only does the spiritual realm exist, but, but that, that there's an enemy that is opposed to the will of God. Now, I don't, I don't fully understand it. I don't quite get why Satan, honestly, is opposed to the will of God. Like, there are things I kind of get about it, but I don't, you know, I don't know his full motivations and everything like that, but I, that doesn't stop me from believing just because I don't fully understand that it is the case. I really appreciate um, Sig Phaser. If you guys uh, don't know who Sig Phaser is, so Sig Phaser is a missionary we've supported for many years um, in Africa. This is a book he wrote called Glimpses of the Invisible. Um, and what I appreciate about Sig is Sig is very much an analytic type mind. If you, if you talk with him, he's one of those people that it's like, I only understood half of what you said. Even like reading some of his, this, this book, I have to reread things uh, and, and everything. He's a very intelligent, he had a PhD in physics. But this book is about encounters that he's had with the spiritual realm. Like he, he wants people to understand like the spiritual realm is a real thing. Like he's encountered it many times. And it's, and it's not about like, you know, just throwing away your analytic mind. It's not about just, you know, uh, getting, you know, acting dumb or primitive about things, but it's about acknowledging the realities of what's there. Um, and I appreciate one thing that he says in this book. He says, uh, um, so how might you relate to another person's experiences involving angels and demons like those I've shared? Don't overemphasize these overt appearances of the spiritual realm as if they supersede faith and knowledge. But neither should you trivialize them as if they are mere tales. A balance is needed. The Bible itself records many incidents of the direct involvement of spiritual brings, yet our relationship with God, our Redeemer, is not dependent on such encounters. Right? In other words, don't overemphasize the spiritual realm. Don't like get so focused on it that you can't see anything else that you, that you, you know, like are dismissive of, of, of you know, any, anything physical going on. But also, don't be, so dis, don't be dismissive of it either. Recognize that there is a reality there. Recognize that, that, not, that the physical world is not all that there is. Right? Um, that, uh, that we do face an enemy against us that opposes God, that's opposed to, to, to the things of God. And so if we are part of God's kingdom, then he is opposed to us as well. Now, Paul writes elsewhere about, about this, and, and he makes sure that he knows, he says, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. There is an unseen world. There is an unseen world. There are unseen spiritual beings that are opposed to the things of God. And, and, and even if we don't fully understand it, it's true. And I think that we've seen it affects, right? Like, like there are times in my life where I feel temptations to, to seek things that, that will, will pull me away from God, to try to find fulfillment in things that aren't God. There are times in my life where, where the enemy comes to me and, 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 and questions my identity in God. Makes me, makes me doubt who I am and who Jesus says that I am and what, what he's done for me on the cross, that I'm not good enough or worthy of, of, of God or his love, right? On, on a bigger level, like um, that, that, that when I'm doing something to serve God, that, that, that things seem to, to, to stand against me, like uh, uh, even if they're physical things come up and, and, and stand in the way of doing what God has wanted me to do. 
Like last, earlier this year, I went to Peru, um, and I was there for, for three weeks. I would guess that, that if you asked my wife, it might have been like the hardest three weeks that she's had in a long time. Why did that happen? Was that just coincidence? Or was there something spiritual going on at home to distract me, to, to, to pull me away, to, to, to pull uh, my family's thoughts away? Anyone ever notice that you have the most squabbles in your house getting ready to come to church on Sunday morning? Anyone ever observed that before? Think that's just a coincidence? Or is there something more at work there? Right? We're quick to dismiss these things, but when we take, if we take God and his word seriously, and we take even our experiences in the world seriously, we recognize that there are spiritual things at work. And it can be hard when we say, well, what's, how do we discern like, what's spiritual, what's physical? And I think that that notion of like, dividing the world up into purely phys- spiritual and purely physical isn't a super biblical way to approach the world. Like a biblical world, we recognize that the spiritual realm and the physical realm are interdependent, interconnected. And so it's not like something is, well, this is just spiritual or this is just physical, but when, something that, when there's a physical reality, there's also a spiritual reality taking place. And so what Paul is, is, is saying is, well, not, don't focus on the physical, just focus on the spiritual, but he's saying, look at what the spiritual reality is behind the physical thing that you're experiencing. And so when he's writing to the Thessalonians, he says, I recognize um, that I'm not able to come to you, but that's because there's a spiritual reality that's taking place. And so how do we, uh, so, so if we recognize this spiritual thing, how do we stand against it? Well, the first thing we see, see is Paul, as he says, is that Satan opposed me, but what is, what is Paul doing, even though he can't come and be physically present with the Thessalonians, what's he doing? What does he do? He wrote him a letter, right? He didn't just give up. He didn't just say, well, I guess I, guess I can't do that. I can't go to them. I guess hopefully they'll be okay. Right? He, he, he recognizes, like, hey, Satan is opposing me. There's, 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 there's spiritual opposition that doesn't want me to go, go here. And so I'm going to do, do what I can do. I'm going, to, I'm going to write them a letter. I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to remind them of these, these things. I'm going to remind them of these truths. Right? Um, he says, I'm not going to just give up because I experience a little bit of opposition, but I'm going to persevere and still accomplish what I want to accomplish. And so, so we see in this that when we face these, this opposition from the enemy, we discern the enemy's strategies and persevere against them. When we discern the enemy's strategies, we persevere against them. Don't give up. All right, so I need two volunteers. I'm going to pick adults this time. I want some adults. But I need someone who's not afraid of talking in front of people. I need an adult, adult that's not afraid of talking from people. I wanted to get Chad. I was hoping Chad would be here. He'd be perfect. Any adults that aren't afraid of talking from people? All right, Nubia, come on up. All right, I need one other person. You don't have to talk. Nubia will do the talking. All right, Tori, come on up. All right, hopefully you're competitive too, Nubia. That would help. Are you competitive? Good. Awesome. You're perfect. All right, so I have two boxes here. One of these boxes has a brownie in it. It's called Brownie in a Box. Brownie in a box, okay? One of these boxes has a brownie in it. Nubia, when I say so, you're going to look inside your box, and you'll either see there's a brownie or no brownie. You can go ahead and look. That's fine. Okay, but don't say. Don't say. Tori, no peeking. No peeking. All right, so now you've seen Nubia. If you've got the box with a brownie or no brownie, now you have just a, uh, you, you're going to try to convince Tori to either take your box um, uh, or uh, to keep your box, right? You're going to try to convince Tori to either swap with you or to keep your boxes. And what you want is you want to end up with the box of brownies. So go ahead, convince Tori. Tori, I have this wonderful box here. I think she probably is going to take it, and we can just swap. This is my box. Do you think she's going to take it? Why? Yeah. Okay, so you take your, and you touch it again, it even gives you a little bit of disappointment. Yeah. Oh, all right. So, Tori, you're going to stick with yours. All right. So, how many people think that the brownie is in new in this box? So, Tori gets to pick. Now, they're going to keep it. Now, how many people think the brownie's here? How many people think the brownie's here? Wait, I want to see what Manny picked. What did you, th- you think this one? All right. <laughs> all right. 
Tori, open your box up. No, no brownie. All right, you get you can keep the brownie, Nubia. <laughs> yeah. All right, give them a hand. Oh, actually, wait, wait. Stay up here. Stay up here, Tori. Why did you pick your box? You're a... Oh, I try to go with the Your voice is high pitched, and that usually means people are lying if they're talking in a high pitched voice. So no to, to anyone if you're trying to lie to Tori. Talk like this. <laughs> All right, you can, keep your, you, can take, you can take your brownie. I need the box, though, so you can take the brownie out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so the point of this game was that Tori had to try to discern the strategy that Nubia was using. Unfortunately, Tori did poorly at that. <laughs> right, you had to try to discern the strategy that it's using. Right, this is the same thing that we have to do with our enemy, right? We don't just look at like, well, I'm feeling being opposed by Satan. God's making it hard for our family to get ready. I, I, you know, I sat down to read my Bible, but whatever, whatever it is comes up um, uh, that, that maybe I'm facing this weird illness or sickness, maybe something more serious like that. Whatever it is, we don't just stop there. We say, what's, the, what's behind this? Even more so is, is remember that Paul says our battle is not against what? Flesh and blood, right? Oftentimes, I can get upset with somebody. Maybe it's, maybe it's Anne, maybe it's our kids, maybe it's, you know, someone, uh, I was going to say someone I work with, that'd be Gail, but I don't know if I've ever been upset with Gail, actually, but, <laughs> uh, right? Like, maybe it's your boss. Like, you can get upset with a person, and you can want to lash out against them. You can want to say, why do they, they act this way? Why do they treat me this way? And, 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 you, and, you, and you focus all your energy on, on them, and you never stop to ask the question, wait, is there a spiritual component behind this? And I'm not saying that, that Anne or my children are like possessed by demons, but I'm saying that there's a spiritual reality out there that, that impacts all of us, that all of us can get impacted by the spiritual realm, by, by spiritual forces, and that, we can, uh, and that if we fail to recognize them, that we can fail to see the strategy of the enemy. Right, Paul, so, so Paul says that, that Satan opposed us. We have an Acts, we have a description of what happened. Um, whoops, I forgot to put it in here up on the screen. Oh, there it is. There it is, okay. Uh, 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 this is what, the, how Acts describes Paul's visit to Thessalonica. It says, Paul and Silas then traveled through the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service, and for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scripture to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. Some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, among, uh, along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. But some of the Jews were jealous, and so they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. They attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas so they could drag them out to the crowd. And not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted, and now they're disturbing our city too. And Jason has welcomed them into his home. They're guilty of treason against Caesar, for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. And the people of the city, as well as the city council, were thrown into turmoil by these reports. The officials forced Jason and the other believers to post bond. And when they released them that very night, uh, and then they released them. And that very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. When they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. So what's interesting about that, 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 uh, that story is, does it say anything about Satan in that story? Does it say anything about spiritual forces of darkness in that story? No, it kind of gives us a very like, this is what happened type account of the story. And yet Paul looks at these same events and he says, uh, says uh, tried to come to you, but Satan has hindered it, right? There's a discernment by Paul that takes place of the spiritual reality. Like Paul could say those Jews hindered it, that, that, that we know from, from the letter of Thessalonica, it's not just the Jews, that some of the Gentiles are opposing the church. He say those guys that are against you, they opposed it. We need to go get them. We need to stop them. We need to get back at them. He could see them as the problem, but what Paul says is that Satan has hindered us. That, that yes, this physical reality is taking place. Yes, it's even working, in, that Satan is even working through people, but ultimately they are not our enemy. 
They are not what we're battling against. Ultimately, we're battling against a, a spiritual power, a spiritual force. And I'm not going to let that spiritual force stop me from doing what God has called me to do. I'm going to persevere past it. I'm going to let you know that I'm here with you in heart, even if I can't be in, with you in spirit or, or in, in, phys, in physical days. I'm going to continue to encourage you. Encourage you. I'm going to let God deal with the people that are opposing us, and I'm going to stand against the scheme of Satan as I, as I work it. Are you right now looking at just the physical world? Are you just seeing the physical things that are happening? Are you recognizing the way that the spiritual forces are at work in your life? Are you discerning what's really going on? And are you recognizing the schemes of the enemy and the strategies of the enemy and saying, I'm not going to let those prosper. I'm going to stand against those. I'm going to persevere past those strategies. Are you taking the reality of our enemy seriously and yet not living in fear of him? We ask ourselves as we encounter the, the, these things in our life, even when they come from people, who is my real enemy? What is his strategy? And how do I stand opposed to that? But Paul in Thessalonians doesn't stop there. So he says that Satan hindered us from coming to you. And he says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus that is coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and our joy. Right? So he reminds them, he says, says uh, that Satan stand against us, but I'm, I'm persevering. That's kind of the implication. I'm, I'm writing you this letter. I'm still going to be with you. And why am I doing it? Because I have a hope of what's going to be when Jesus comes, when Jesus returns. Right? He says, I'm not just going to look at this with the, the, the present circumstances, but I'm looking at the future of uh, uh, eternal reality. And so uh, when we feel opposed by the enemy, we see, we view our present circumstances through eternal eyes. We view our present circumstances through eternal eyes. Right? We don't just look at the discouragements. We don't just look at the, the hardships. We don't just look at the opposition. I'm not just focus on those things, but I'm focused on the coming kingdom and the hope that there is in that. That Jesus came to fix a broken world, that he died and rose again, uh, that he inaugurated his kingdom and that the, that the fullness of that kingdom will come. And so why do we persevere in the face of opposition is because we have hope that that perseverance will pay off. That even if we don't see the effects of it right now, that Jesus is going to establish his kingdom and that, they're, they're, that, that we will see the victory in what we've, what we've done. The verse I quote all the time, right? Do not be, uh, do not be weary. Ah, now, I'm, now I'm messing it up. I'm just blinking on my head all of a sudden. This is the verse I say all the time. I know this one. Uh, do not be weary in doing. Uh, uh, do not be weary. Become weary in doing good, knowing that in the Lord your labor is never in vain. I still kind of butchered it a little bit. That's pretty much the, the verse. <laughs> Uh, be, therefore, be steadfast and movable, never, uh, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing in the Lord your labor is never in vain. There, the switch finally went. There it is. <laughs> um, yeah, don't give up. Persevere. Keep working for God, knowing that he's going to accomplish something. Right? Paul says, I persevered past the attacks. I, I, I knew the opposition wouldn't last forever. Um, I knew that uh, it would take my eye, I would take my eyes off it. And I continued to love them, right? Because one day I'm going to stand with you in eternity and I'm going to say, because I persevered, you're standing here with me. Because I didn't give up when we faced opposition, you're worshiping at the same throne that I am. I'm not going to just see how hard the devil's making it. I'm not going to just see how discouraged I'm feeling right now. I'm not going to just go with how I'm feeling in this moment. I'm going to go with the victory of Jesus, the hope that I have in his kingdom, and I'm going to live in that reality, and I'm going to fix my eyes on that, and that even when I'm feeling discouraged now, I'm going to remember that there's hope for the future, that there is a cross of suffering, but there is an empty tomb of victory. Right? Some of you right now are in situations where you're, you're facing opposition and difficulties, where you want to give up, where you want to throw in the towel, where you want to lash out at people, lash out at things, that, that your eyes are focused on all the things around you saying, give up, stop. 
What you're doing is not accomplishing anything. And what Scripture encourages us to do is to lift our eyes to our resurrected Savior, to the good news of the gospel that, that, that Jesus has, has conquered, that Jesus has established his kingdom, that we are a part of that, and to walk according to that truth and to that promise. Don't give up. And you know that God is calling you to obey, not to take matters into your own hands. Don't just see the present trials, but see the eternal reality that's taking place. And this leads us to to our last point we're going to say. This is something that I said last week that was not in my notes, but I really felt like impressed by, you know, sometimes I I write stuff, but then I ended up just, like God just, I feel like kind of starts speaking through me, not like in like some sort of weird way, but just that the Holy Spirit inspires me and, and speaks. Uh, and I feel like that felt that very much last week. I felt many people say that. And this is something that was not in my notes last week, but, uh, but I felt impressed to put back in my notes this week because I think it's something God wants us to hear right now is that we are victor, victors, not victims. Whoops, I put it the blanks. <laughs> I, was, I must have been tired when I was doing, making these, these notes. The, the blanks there are supposed to say, we are victors, not victims. We are victors, not victims. Right? We are not victor, vic, victims. We face oppression. We face hardship. We face trauma. We face difficult situations. We face opposition in our life. And those things uh, have real impacts on us. Since this isn't to dismiss anything that we faced, any hardship we are facing or have faced in our life. It's not to, to make light of any of those things, but to say, ultimately, when we understand the victory of Jesus, that we are not victims of those things, that Christ has overcame those things, that we are victors in him, that we have hope in him, that that, that is the reality that we, we live in, that, that just because life is hard, just because we, got, we face opposition to what God has called us to do does not mean that that is the reality that we live in. It does not mean that the hopelessness we feel is necessarily what is real does not mean that the discouragement or the questioning of why or what's going on is is, is ultimately what's true, but ultimately is true is Christ and his kingdom, and so we live in the victory of that. The schemes of the enemy have come to nothing. Right? Even the cross of Christ. What's interesting is when we read scripture, the cross of Christ, it's, it's called both the plan of the enemy and the plan of God. Right, like that, that, that Satan was at work on the cross of Christ, that, that Satan and, and, and dark forces brought him there, but ultimately it was God's plan for redemption. It was God's plan for conquering. That Christ has overcome the work of the enemy. You know, no weapon formed against us will prosper when we are walking in the will of God. And I was thinking about this. So in, the, in relation to 1 Thessalonians here, um, so, so Paul wrote uh, the, the book of 1 Thessalonians, right? So he, he felt this opposition. He writes the book of 1 Thessalonians. Um, and when he sat down to write the book of 1 Thessalonians, he wasn't like, all right, so today I'm going to sit down and write the Bible, right? He was just like, I really want to go see this church. I really want to encourage them. I can't for whatever reason. We don't even know what it is. But for whatever reason, I can't. Satan's opposing it. But I'm not going to stand for that. I'm going to, and so I'm going to write them a letter, and hopefully that will encourage them. And so he wrote them this letter, just to write a letter to his friends, just to encourage them. And then what ended up happening is that because God is greater, because the Holy Spirit is, is stronger, is not only did God take that letter and have it encourage the Thessalonian Christians, but now for thousands of years, it's encouraged millions of Christians. Right, God has, has, has overcame the plans of Satan. He's thwarted the plans of Satan. He has, 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 uh, has, has given the victory and worked in ways that Paul didn't even expect. And so we persevere in the hope of the victory of God, that God can work in ways that we don't expect, in mighty ways that we don't see, that when we trust in him, that he is fighting the battle. 
And so what I want us to do as, as a close day is I want you to close your eyes. I want everybody in here to close your eyes. And I want you to ask God to show you how is the enemy at work in keeping you from serving and worshiping and following God? What is the strategies of the enemy in your life right now? Remember that the battle's not against flesh and blood. If God's bringing, uh, if, or if, if people are coming to your mind, there's, look at the spiritual realities that are behind that. What strategies is the enemy using? What are you needing to do to persevere past this? Open your eyes. Look at me. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That hopelessness you might be feeling right now, that questioning that you have, that doubt that you have, the the exhaustion you feel, that's not all there is. We are more than overcomers through him who loved us. You may be weary. You may feel like the battle's not going well. But Christ is victorious. He has overcome. And we hang on to that promise as his people. And we operate from a place of victory as his people. And so as we come and receive communion today, that's what I want to encourage you to reflect on is the victory that you have in Christ to lift your eyes up from the the circumstances you're facing, from the trials you have, from the physical realities that are wearing you down, that are discouraging you, that are making you question everything, and lift your eyes up to the eternal reality of our King who has conquered and His kingdom that is coming. Let's come and take, take this bread and take this juice and take it back to your seat and we'll take it together. overcome for you and for us in his life.
For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. God, we thank you for the cross. The cross where you suffered. Where the spiritual forces of darkness were aligned against the things of God. Where God himself suffered and died on a cross. God, we thank you that Jesus entered into our world, faced the same challenges, suffering and opposition we face. And we thank you for the cross where he conquered those things. We take this bread and we say thank you for our conquering Savior. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and is the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger and sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through them who, through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, that through it we are victorious. God, we take this cup and we say thank you that we have victory because of your victory. And so God, I pray for us this morning that we would go forth from this place encouraged, that we would know that the battle is real, that our enemy is real, that the spiritual realm is real, but that we don't come to it in a place of fear, that because of the cross of Christ, we come to it from a place of victory. Help us to see the schemes and the strategies of the enemy that want to keep us from worshiping and obeying and serving you, and help us respond against those things to not just see the physical realm, not just see the physical people the physical opposition, but to see the spiritual reality that takes place. Open our eyes to see and help us to stand against and walk in victory more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Go in victory.